think so. Yep. All right. How are y'all? I was telling them it's it's different preaching in South Africa. You don't know anybody. Um, takes all the pressure off. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. Um, thank you, pastors. Uh, it's really humbling to be up here. And um, yeah, I believe I have a relevant word. Um, when I was praying about what to talk about, um, the Lord reminded me of. Uh, uh, I want to call it a Holy Spirit download that happened when I was driving in the car about three years ago when I was leaving church. I'd just gotten saved and um, driving on 17, and it was it was a summer night, um, as you can guess, like it was pretty busy. I would say 98% of the cars on the road had their lights on, but there's always one or two that don't have their headlights on, and I I've, we drive past cars all the time without their lights on, and it, we never think anything of it. But in that moment, I, got, I was convicted, and I realized that I needed an intimate relationship with Jesus. And I'll kind of unpack that a little bit for you. Um, it was like in a moment, I realized that the cars that were driving with their lights off could see the road because of the cars that had their lights on. You know, it's common sense. We can also be in church two times a week around people that have a relationship with Jesus, that have the light of life in them, get familiar with the atmosphere, but not have the light inside of us ourselves. So what happens when we're on the road by ourselves without the light? We're lost. We're in a ditch. Um, so I kind of compared, like I realized that, um, let's see, all, the cars that were on the road represented believers, the light represented um, the relationship with Jesus. And then the road traveled was like, it was like life. Like it's, we're, we're in dark times. We're all on the way to heaven. We're, we're walking with the Lord. But some of us, are, our lights, or our lamps are burning out. And some of us may not even have lamps burning. And then some of us were good. So I hope that at least gets drilled into your mind like it has mine preparing to sum, um, this message because now every time I'm driving, I'm like, I see, okay, there's cars without their lights on. Do they know Jesus? It, and it's kind of um, like a parable or a um, revelation that I got from God, which goes into what I'm going to be talking about tonight, which is um, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. And I'm using the ESV um, and... We're going to talk about uh, the parable of the ten virgins. And just right, out, right off the bat, just think about it as the ten virgins as being ten Christians. Because it's for believers. It's directed to believers. Um, and it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And, and or as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to, open to us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. A um, couple of things uh, I want to point out is the lifespan of, a, of us when we come to know Jesus as believers starts from the moment we accept Jesus until he either returns or until we take our last breath. So when thinking about this parable, I know it's talking about when Jesus returns, but in reality it's also talking about we need to be ready to meet him tonight if it were our time to go. Um, and so 
thinking about it, I received my lamp the moment that I accepted Jesus. And ever since then, I've been on a journey to meet him face to face. Uh, it's just like the car on the road with the lights on. Um, and the way we live after we accept Jesus into our heart, that matters. And as we'll break down in a minute, um, we need to make sure that our lamps are burning and that they're burning brightly for him because we are the light of the world. And without Jesus, we're nothing. He said, abide in me. He's like, apart from me, you can do nothing. And my concern is that while he tarries, that we can get distracted with a thousand different things or we could let a little bit of compromise sneak in here or we could just, you know, veer away from the most important relationship in our lives, and that is with Jesus. Um, and <clears throat> so another thing, um, as I was looking at commentary um, on, on this parable, was it was at the darkest hour when the foolish virgins realized that they were unprepared. And as the days get darker ahead, we need to make sure now, we need to do soul searching now, that we are prepared to walk and be the light of the world because we have the answers that everyone's looking for. We, we know the king of the universe and the world doesn't and we, we've got to be prepared. Um, and another thing I wanted to point out was 50% of the believers in this parable didn't get in because they weren't prepared. Now, I, I don't, I don't want to go like too far into it, but I'm just, half of them didn't get into the marriage feast. And the reason I titled this message, um, Storing the Oil of Intimacy, is because in verse 12, what does it say? It says, truly, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. That's where I got that from. He, they, he didn't know who they were, so... They started out believers, but something happened where he, he, he did not know them. He, they neglected intimacy. They, they turned away while he was tarrying. They weren't focused on the end in mind. And I just, as a church and as a body of Christ, I just um, believe that, well, I know that the hour is late and it is past time that we um, come out of the world and um, focus single-mindedly on Jesus. Um, and we've, oh yeah, we've all heard it say, we, we've heard the saying, it's not religion, it's about relationship. And that is true. And what I, what I did was I sat down and um, started to make a list of what the, like the characteristics of the foolish virgins or the foolish believers versus the wise believers. And just a heads up, I've been uh, almost on every one of these for the foolish, I've, it's, it's been me in my life at some point. So I don't want to offend anybody. I'm just, I'm just saying, just a, just a heads up, I'm preaching to myself, honestly. One of the things I, when I was praying about what to talk about, I was like, Lord, I don't want to talk about anything that you're not, or haven't dealt with me over. Um, and that's kind of, that's helped me do this. But, all right, so the foolish, we're just going to go through the foolish virgins because we're either one of the two. We're either the wise believers or we're the foolish. Like this parable is for us. So I believe um, the foolish didn't count the cost. Uh, they weren't totally dependent upon Jesus. Had they been, they wouldn't have neglected him. And had they accounted the cost, they would have known that they couldn't have done what he's asking of them in their own strength. Um, they weren't playing the long game, or they weren't living with the end in mind. Um, you know, when we actually sit down and think about the fact that we're going to <laughs> be with Jesus forever, um, that's not like, w that's what we are, that's our expectation. But it it can be easy to get distracted and the world right now will do everything that it can to get you from that vision, from that realization, to try to get you away 
from Jesus. So I believe the foolish, um, th they were, were not living with the end in mind. Um, I also believe they were weakened warriors or bi-weekly believers, part-time Christians. Um, they came to church t uh, two days a week, but then lived like hell the other five days of the week. And again, I've been, I've been here, so I'm not, yeah, talking about anybody here, so don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> I believe they were talkers, but not walkers. They were deceiving themselves by hearing the word and not doing the word. Um, <laughs> I've been there too. Um, instead of, <laughs> here's one. Instead of walking with resurrection power, they continually resurrected the old man, living as an enemy of the cross, being carnally minded, sowing to the flesh instead of the spirit. Um, yeah, that reaps corruption. I believe the foolish also feared man more than they feared God. And the Bible does say that the fear of man is a trap. And I will have more Bible verses here in a little bit, so don't get too concerned. Um, I believe the foolish were also um, potentially fence riders. And we've all heard the saying that Satan owns the fence. Jesus said, you either gather with me or you scatter. And indecision is actually a decision to join Satan's team. Uh, this is heavy. Sorry. I believe that the... Um, they, were, they possessed a form of godliness, but they denied the power. In other words, they cultivated a spirit of religion instead of, they cultivated a religious spirit instead of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And the difference there is when you prioritize time and intimacy with Jesus, little sins, when you're walking in the light, they, he, he he shines light on them, like he, he brings them up, and, and you have to deal with them. And going to, thinking about Judas, the Bible said that he was a theft. He had sins that had he been walking closer with Jesus, they probably would have been dealt with. And it says he gave the devil, it gave the devil a foothold in his life. So then when the opportunity came, that foothold was already there, and the devil just came right in, put it in his heart, to portray Jesus, and it happened. So when I, when I talk about the um, cultivated a religious spirit instead of intimacy with the Holy Spirit, that's kind of what I was referring to. And again, <laughs> I've been there as well, and yeah. So we're talking about the foolish Christians in the parable, um, the ones whose light went out, um, the ones who... Late in the game, when the pressure was on, they, they weren't prepared. Um, they started out with good intentions, but they, they weren't enduring. Um, and I believe that another characteristic could have been lukewarm. They could have been passive, silent. And God's really been convicting me on some of this stuff, especially with the passivity um, because Jesus was never passive. And if God is a, a, an all-consuming fire, and I'm taking this from Reinhard Bonnke, um, rest in peace, um, but he said, uh, um, freezing Christianity cannot represent him. Um, so we can't be passive um, with regards to preaching and, and talking to the lost. Um, and I also believe one of the characteristics of um, the foolish believers were, um, I think the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches captivated their hearts. Um, it took them, it pulled them away from the intimacy with Jesus. Um, going back to the parable of the sower, um, I believe that some of them had a rocky ground hearts, which means that the soil was not that deep. So when trials and pressures came on account of the word they were offended and they fell away i'm just because we this is real life stuff that we all deal with like right now in, in 2024 um and lastly 
I believe that one of the reasons that they, their lights went out was that they had fallen away from first love. And the reason I believe this is, I, I want to go to Revelation 2, uh, verses 1 through 5, ESV, really quick. And it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven gold lampstands. Here the lampstands refer, referring to the church. Um, he said, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first, if not I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that these people didn't make it into heaven. Um, I'm, I, I'm just saying we need to be diligent and <laughs> lay hold to what the Lord laid hold of us. Like I, there's so much more that is getting ready to happen um, that we just got we just got to dare to dream big and believe that Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever he's the same here as he is in Africa and Brazil and all these other places and um, I just think we need to be hungry and expectant to move in power signs and wonders but at, at the same time move and grow up in in holiness and 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 righteousness so that we can come the full mature Christians that the last day church is described as being and <clears throat> I want to talk about the wise um, a few of the characteristics of the wise um, if, if you can go back to the parable that would be cool um, they were prepared to meet the king that's uh, that's obvious um, the whole thing's about preparation um, how were they prepared well Jesus knew them and again, I, I'm, look, I'm reading a lot into the verses, I do not know you. Um, but in scripture, I mean, it, it talks about it in other places. But I believe they were obedient um, to the Holy Spirit. They were intimate with Jesus. And when you're intimate with Jesus and you spend time with him and you see him and you get to know him more, you see how, who you were created to be. So then you're able to care about the things that he cares about, see people the way he sees people, and it just he, he rubs off on you. And it's um, so I, I do believe that that intimacy with him was onto obedient works of righteousness. Because if you look at the next parable, it's the parable of the talents, and he rebukes the person who received one talent and buried it in the ground and didn't do anything with it. So if you put them together with the lamps and the talents. It's, it's a, about intimacy onto being busy doing the Father's business. Like, we're not just here to... I grew up hearing, like, if you just acknowledge that Jesus was... You didn't have to do anything else. You could live like the rest of the world, but it's the whole James thing where faith without works is dead. Like, faith actually isn't passive. It looks like something. So we don't... We're not saved because of the works that we do, but the Bible does say in Ephesians and a lot of other places, we're saved unto good works. And that's because our fathers never stopped working. Jesus has never stopped working. We're made in the image of God, so we need to be doing something. And when we're intimate with him, he will tell us what we need to be doing. He'll show us the way in this dark generation. And any attempt to do it without him is religion and not relationship so um, so I've just got a, a little bullet list here it says um, storing the oil of intimacy it keeps the fire in our lamps burning okay it helps us navigate the dark days ahead it purifies our hearts and our motives um, again because if they weren't pure they would be pointed out it trust me um, <laughs> Gives us, it, it gives us the grace to endure until the end. Um, 
God provides grace, gives grace to the humble. Um, and yeah, need, knowing, when we know that we need God, like one of the things I learned in, in YWAM and other and here as well, but the more we mature as Christian believers, it's not the less dependent that we are on God. It's more, the, yeah, it's an opposite. It's like the upside down kingdom thing. Like the more we grow, the more we know that we need Jesus. So that's where I got, that's where I put the grace. It gives us the grace to endure to the end. Um, it keeps us filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. Um, it causes us to grow in the grace of God. Again, I'm talking about what being intimate with Jesus, um, what it results from that. Um, it gives us a heavenly perspective to our day-to-day problems. Um, a lot of the times, the enemy or familiar spirits or whatever you want to call it, w- pastors talked about it, knows which buttons to push, um, will try to get you offended, anything to, to get your eyes off of what you're, like, who you're called to be, what you're actually supposed to be doing, and, and who your source is. If you can get us looking uh, horizontally instead of vertically, um, then he's won, or he's on the path of winning. So, um, And storing the oil of intimacy also prepares us for heaven. It's better... <laughs> It's going to be better that when we actually see Jesus face to face that we already have spent time with him. I, it, it won't, I don't, I mean, it could still be kind of scary. Everybody that's actually seen Jesus fell in their face, but you know what I mean. Um, it prepares us for heaven. So <clears throat> I've, I've got four questions that I feel like can keep us on track um, with regards to um, our relationship with Jesus. And I feel like the enemy in the world try to attack these four things. And they are, it is, who are you? Why are you here? Where are you headed? And how are you getting there? Like, those are the questions, like, and, and that's identity, purpose, destiny, and then our vehicle, like how, Yeah. Um, and or another way you could put it is, how does heaven see you? What is the hope of your calling? Are you living with the end in mind? And then the vehicle being living by faith and intimacy with Jesus. But for the first one, for who are you? Um, one of the teachers, when I first went to YWAM, um, he's a theologian, and he drove me, cra- he drove me really crazy because I was legal. One of my pitfalls and ditches is legalism. I'm growing out of that, but he used to drive me crazy because he would say, when I first heard that God loved me, that I didn't have to do anything to earn his love, I was like, that's blasphemy. There's no, what do you mean? (laughs) But now I'm like, and he's, and we were talking about our identity, and he put this down, and finally, after like a year, I was like, you know what, he was actually, he was really right, but so this is how I answer the who are you question, and you guys can use it as well, but is, the answer is, I am Kyle, loved by God, lover of God. I mean, and if you think about it, that, there's nothing really higher than that. When you, if you know God loves you, and you love God, that it's like the answer to life's questions or problems or challenges. Um, second one, I'm a new creation in Christ. We all know the I am, there's an I am sheet. Lester got me on it back when we first got saved, and I put it on the window of my, or my mirror in my bathroom, confessing who we are in Christ. So some of these are, all of these are going to be familiar to us, but um, that is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. ESV, by the way. I just decided to mix it up because I know Pastor doesn't use the ESV. Um <laughs> No, no, no. Um, and, and that's just the I am a new creation in Christ verse. Um, I am a child of God. That is First John um, 3, 2. Again, these are, what's up? Okay, no worries. Um, <laughs> is, 
It says, all right, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians um, 6, 19, verse 19 through 20. And the key part about that verse, there we go. Or do you not, oh yeah, a pastor has his iPad. I've got like a piece of paper with the scriptures stapled here. All right, which one is that? 1 Corinthians. Yeah, therefore, if any, no. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God, you are not your own. That's the part, you were bought at a price. That's the part I wanted to highlight because if when I, I struggled with that at first, but then I'm, I'm, I'm still growing into it. But there's so much freedom when we realize that we're not in control of us, that we're not the potter, that we're the clay. It, and it's a work in progress, at least it w- has been for me, but we belong to the king. And it says, so glorify God in our bodies. And, the, and again, I'm trying to talk, ab- or I'm talking about four ways to keep us on track with intimacy with Jesus and how that we can not be contaminated in the world <coughs> that we live in. So the next one is um, 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21. That's I'm a vessel for honor. And that says, um, now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some honorable, some dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart, holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So we were cre- we're new creations in Christ Jesus unto good works. Like that's that's the picture I'm trying to paint. And the next one. I'm a royal priest. This, I, I would tell people to at YWAM, I, I, when I was staffing, my, my one staff thing, um, but I was like, look, you're a royal priest in training. Like, you got to be above reproach. You're a priest in training. It, and it says that in Exodus. It says it um, right here in First Peter where it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's me, and I know that's everyone here. Um, and, and so now I go to the second question. Why are you here? And this is the purpose uh, question. Um, and I put, what is the hope of your calling? And the scripture for this is Mark 12, verses 30 through 31. And... And the answer to that is to love God and to love people. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So if we can be single-minded on those two things, isn't it funny, at least for me, that loving people is actually one of the hardest things that we're called to do, and it's the thing we're called to do. Which, remi- which means we need to be connected to Jesus because if we're trying to do it without Jesus, it's, yes. I mean, the whole, this is, I'm talking about intimacy here, and these are, you know, these are identity statements and uh, purpose statements, but all of this is unto intimacy um, with Jesus. Um, the next scripture is um, to know God personally. That's John 17:3. Um, this is eternal life, that they know you. So just using that, the, the parable of the ten Christians or the ten virgins, however, you, half of them didn't know, Jesus didn't know half of them, but he knew the other half. Uh, knowing Jesus and knowing God and having a two-way relationship is the whole reason we're alive. Like the... One of the ways the enemy used to get me was um, I believed because I was the only child and my mom had me relatively late, he would whisper that I was an accident. And I believed that until I got rebuked severely by somebody and they pointed out the whole Psalms 139, like I was created, the Lord created me. And I was not, I'm not an accident. Like he formed me in the womb. He's got a plan and a purpose, but Um, and that purpose and plan is to know him and to be loved by him, and that's what we're here for. Um, 
next um, verse, Romans 3.23, we're called to bring glory to God. And uh, uh, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And now that Jesus has restored what man has lost, we are called to bring glory to God. Um, it's kind of simple. Um, let's see. Where, okay, yep. Wait. Oh, yeah. Last one for the why are you here? Bless you. It's to do the will of God on earth. Um, and that's and Matthew seven twenty one ESV. And it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, don't you love this verse? will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Again, if we know Jesus and we're intimate with Jesus, we're going to be doing the will of the Father in, in, in heaven. But if we try to do religion without relationship with Jesus, then that could lead to some other things. But God's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's really kind. I mean, the fact that he would even want to be in a relationship with me blows my mind um because like i i i contemplated giving my testimony here but i I'm, i'd rather glorify jesus um and and talk about the word but yeah so if there's anybody that's like believes that jesus that that you're too bad or that you've done something um that's like unforgivable or that the lord isn't knocking on the door of your heart right now to um, come in and, and sup with you, um, it's, it's a lie. The Lord wants intimacy. He died when we were all dead in sin so that he could live with us and know us, and, and it's going to be a glorious, it's something we're going to experience for the rest of eternity. Um, but it, it starts now. The invitation is now. Um, so I want to talk about where are we headed? What is our destiny? Um, because if we are living with the end in mind, we're living like the wise believers who were anticipating the day of Jesus' return. They were prepared in case he tarried. Um, and this first scripture I want to look at is eight, Romans 8, 29. Um, and we are, yes, we're going to heaven. That's obviously like if we're thinking about the end, we're thinking about heaven that's amazing but on earth what are we looking forward to to be conformed into the image of Jesus and it says for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be that um, in order that he might be the firstborn of many brothers um, it's back to the Christ in you the hope of glory thing like if and this leads me to my next verse. Peter is pretty much gives us the key to how to never be idle or um, lacking in our Christian life. Um, and that's in Second Peter 1, verses 3 through 11. And this is in the Amplified. Um, it says, For his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through the true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has bestowed on us his precious and magnificent promises of inexpressible value so that by them you may escape from the immoral freedom that is in the world because of disruptible desire and become shares of, this is what I was trying to get at, that was a mouthful, uh, shares of the divine nature for this very reason, applying your diligence to the divine promises, make every effort um, to add to your faith the development of moral excellence and to moral excellence, knowledge, insight, and understanding, and to knowledge, self-control, self-control, steadfastness, steadfastness, godliness, um, and in your godliness, brotherly affection. In your brotherly affection, develop Christian love, that is, learn to unselfishly seek the best for others and to do things for their benefit. And then he says this part right here. For as these qualities are yours and are increasing in you as you grow towards spiritual maturity, they will keep you from being useless and unproductive 
in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, um, short-sighted, um, to the fact, or bl oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, believers, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Be sure that your behavior reflects and confirms your relationship with God. For by doing these things, actively developing these virtues, you will never stumble in your spiritual growth and will live a life that leads others away from sin. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus will be abundantly provided to you. So, that was a lot. Um, gosh, I need some water. But um, we, we have stuff that we can be doing with Jesus um, in our relationship, in our spiritual walk. Like, there are left, like we're not going to reach the climax. Like, we're not going to reach perfection while we're here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so we should never just be content with where we're at when we can always be growing in one area, one virtue or another. Um, and the exciting thing is once we step in to these other areas and intentionally pursue growth in them, we experience more of the Lord when we do that. That's what, kind of what Peter was saying. It's like the more we put on Christ and intentionally it's like the Elvis impersonator guy. I'm not saying the more you dress and sing and dance like Elvis, you experience Elvis. But in a certain way, when you do that with Jesus, you experience Jesus. Because what did Paul say? That I might know him and something about his sufferings. Yeah. So, like, we need to put on Christ daily. We need to know that we're called to be conformed to his image, um, to be transformed in our character. And then Ephesians says, in Ephesians 4.13, until we all attain the unity of our faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I mean, there we go. That, how do we stay out of the world? How do we make sure we're pursuing intimacy? Um, in order to accomplish any of these things, we have to, be in relationship with Jesus we can't do it in our own strength but it's something that if we start doing as believers people will be saved we talk about politics and politics is great but if we as a church would can just shine like we're supposed to shine and the nation will change not to say we shouldn't vote that's not what I'm saying but like we, if, we, if everybody who professed to know Jesus actually acted like they knew Jesus, the world would not be the same place is what I was trying to say. And that's me included. So uh, that's all I was trying to say with that part. Um, and finally, how are we going to get there? So how, if we're living with the end in mind, we know our identity, um, we know what we're called for and called unto, how are we getting there? Well, the vehicle is... Living by faith, that's Galatians 2.12, um, and this is what Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the, the answer is we wake up, we put on Christ, well, and it actually starts with believing what God says is true about us and our circumstances and our future and who he is that's like that's step one but then it's like living that out daily and growing daily um secondly um matthew 7 verses 13 through 14 it's the straight and narrow way um it says enter by the narrow gate and um, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Um, yeah. And then the next thing I, I want to say, it, it's how are we getting there? What's the vehicle? And it falls under the umbrella of living by faith, but the dying to self part, uh, that has been a new thing. For me, the Lord helped me overcome 
drug addiction, alcoholism, all this stuff. But I, and I didn't see anything wrong with the nicotine addiction that I had. I wouldn't have called it an addiction. It was an addiction. But the closer that I got to Jesus, and I'm not saying that if you're, unless you're convicted by the Holy Spirit, that's, I'm not judging anybody. But I realized that the closer that I wanted to walk with the Lord, the less things I could take with me. Um, and, and dying to self, like, I, a year ago, like, uh, and I just got delivered from this about a month ago. Um, but the dying to self part, I, it's, a, it's a real thing, there's, but there's freedom there. It's not something we do, like, legalistically, but you know if, if you're being convicted of something and you're just being disobedient. And it's different for everybody. Um, evidently for me, it was a huge red flag because it was awful. Like, my conscience, thank the Lord, it works now. I don't think it worked five, seven years ago when I was doing every drug in the world, but the Lord can redeem anything, and that includes your mind and your conscience. It, it works now. Um, <laughs> praise the Lord. Um, but, yeah, so di or dying to self, um, and that's like, that's Christianity, one, that's, that's 101. It's the reason why we get baptized in the water. We come up to newness of life. Um, yeah, so we're talking about living by faith. And lastly, um, it's what we talked about the whole time, and that's intimacy with Jesus. How are we going to get to where we're, we're uh, how are we going to get to heaven? How are we going to get to where God has us destined for? And that's intimacy with Jesus. And that's John 15, verses 4 through 6. It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And the last part, apart from me, you can do nothing. And going back to the parable, if the people, <laughs> apart from me, you can do nothing, that includes keeping your lamps burning. Um, and that includes knowing Jesus. It takes Jesus to, it takes God to know God, and it takes God to walk this thing out to the end. So let's focus on the Lord and on intimacy with Jesus and um, have faith that, I mean, we, can, we know for certain that things are going to turn out the way that God says it's going to turn out. So we have nothing to worry about. Um, lastly, um, like what are some practical ways, like how can I grow in intimacy with Jesus? Uh, for me, um, and this is an ongoing process, but make intentional time. You have to schedule time um, to spend, or you'll plan on doing it and you'll never do it. Um, and this is the, it's different for everybody, but in the morning, the early morning hours, that se there seems to be something to that. I don't know, there's a psalm about it. David talked about it. I don't like getting up early in the mornings, but I will tell, I will tell you, though, the couple of times that I've <laughs> been faithful to, I'm talking like the 5 a.m. thing, I, crazy vision, praying. Um, so I need to get back at that. But anyway, intentionally scheduling. Look at your schedule. You know what works for you. Schedule time to just spend with the Lord. Worshiping, we all know that. Um, praise and worship. He inhabits the praises of his people. Um, putting on, this is what I do, uh, and it, it, it helps. And if it, but I get up and I intentionally say I'm putting on Jesus today, and I'm like, Lord, help me see through your eyes today. Um, help me, um, and it's a challenge. Like most of some, often I don't make it out of the house without just dropping the ball in that. But um, j intentionally doing things unto the Lord. It's in Galatians, it's somewhere in one of the uh, epistles where he talks about everything you do, do it unto the Lord and not for people. That literally, that works. Like when, because when you're thinking and God's not a formula, but when you're actually, like, I'm sweeping for the Lord, his presence is right there. Like, and then you're, then you hear, like, you just have to be, he's everywhere. He's right here. You just have to be aware of it. And everything 
in this, in this world is designed to distract you from the presence and from intimacy with the Lord. Like, I mean, everything. It's crazy. Um, but that, that helps. Um, lo- praying, obviously. Doing, do, doing the things that you believe Jesus would do. So the what would Jesus do bracelets. Remember those? The what would Jesus do bracelets. If we could live moment by moment with that thought, like, what would Je- like how would Jesus respond to this situation? And you're kind of like you're growing into just intimacy with him. Um, and, uh, yeah, just intentionality, praise, worship. Yeah, st- oh, yeah, in the word. Just staying in the word and then praying, the w- like, the word. Like, going through the Psalms or, or any of the books and just pray the pray that to the Lord. Confessions, word. Like, there's... There's a lot of ways we can do this, um, but I just, I really believe that we're getting ready to, uh, that there's a separation coming in the body between the, um, the people that are sitting, spectators, and the, the ones who are being active doing the word, um, because the Lord is about, I believe it's going to be like Exodus 2.0, um, with, with what the Lord wants to do. And as the days get darker, we've got to make sure our lamps are shining brightly or we're, <laughs> yeah, that's the only way we get out of this. And it, but it's going to be a fun ride um, because <laughs> God's already moving. Like, he's literally already moving. I can't tell you some of the stuff. Like, there, there, there are kids in the schools that are, like, first, second grade that, have spoken prophetically to me and didn't even realize they were doing it and I had like the fear of the Lord in me like like God is moving and he's he's about to do something new and we just need to be ready and expectant and hungry for it but that's all I got um yeah thank you thank you so I guess I'll pray real quick uh father thank you for this opportunity lord I pray that um everything that was from you lord that it would fall on good soil and holy spirit i ask that you would just continue to lead us and guide us um and and further us into the truth um and just show us new facets of jesus um each day we should never be bored or get tired of the gospels or of jesus let it make us more childlike in our faith lord that we dare to dream big and pray big because you're a big God. Lord, break every box in our head that is limiting you, Lord, and just have your way and um, help us see others the way you see them. In Jesus' name, amen.